Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming out to this, uh, the first Community Curator Talk of 2024. Uh, the Community Curator Program was created last year in response to community desires to have more autonomy in telling their own stories, interpreting objects, and using the museum as a platform. And we're super excited to have it back for a second year and to get to work with so many wonderful, creatively talented individuals like Cole, who's going to be talking in a moment. Um, the talk is being recorded, so if you have a lot of fun, you can relive that fun online later. Um, and if you, you know, shout anything, that will be recorded forever. Um, yeah, thanks so much for coming. And without further ado, here's Cole. Hi. Hamitake <laughs> epi. <laughs> Tashing Tankaru to Emakiapi, Reo Kanto Hemacha Gatinto Winter Emata, Taylor Tiosh by Hemie. Hello, my friends and relatives. Um, I'm Cole Redhorse Taylor, and I'm from the Prairie Island Dakota community, and we are Midwakton, Dakota. Um, I am a descendant of the Kapoja village down river here. I'm also a descendant of, um, and, and through Kapoja, I'm a descendant of Low Crow's people. And I'm, and I'm also a descendant um, on my, um, my grandfather's side from uh, Big Eagle. And that's where a lot of my lineage comes from. And I come from a really strong lineage. And I also come from um, Chief Wabasha, Wabasha's people um, down, uh, south of here uh, on my, my, um, my grandfather's maternal side. And so I come from this land very much. Um, my people have been here since time of memorial. And um, my community has, is a product, we're very small, um, we're one of the four Dakota communities in Minnesota, but we are the product of people that survived a lot, and we're the product of people who remained in our homelands of Minnesota, it's because, you know, this is where our people come from, and I'm also the um, product of people who came home you know, who found their way home after being exiled in, the, in 1862. Um, and I'm also the product of grandparents and great grandparents who survived the boarding school era and who survived, you know, reservation era and just survived, uh, you know, we just become from survivors, you know, I can't um, express that enough. So um, I just want to say thank you for, first off, for being, you know, for allowing me to be here and for this opportunity. This opportunity came about um, kind of in a, through a conversation um, with our relative Pajuta um, when her job was uh, uh, created, thankfully, um, you know, I'm very thankful for the position that she holds and for the relationship that she really wants to build with our community, with all of our um, Dakota communities and, you know, even beyond that, the other indigenous communities in this area. And it kind of came through a conversation with her, you know, we were talking about, you know, by then I, you know, she, she knew of what Kind of work I do. I'm an artist. You know, I don't really like saying that because I think um, there, there is. First off, there is no word in our language for artist in Dakota. There is no word for art. There is no word for someone who is an artist. There is only words for someone who um, who does beadwork, who does quill work, who does um, hide painting, who makes things. You, 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 like I'm a I'm a maker of things. That's what I what my I guess my definition is more so. Um, but she, you know, she was aware of the kind of work that I do, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and so, this opportunity, this uh, opportunity, this talk, and you know, the the community curator case came about from that conversation. And um, I'm just very thankful for that. Um, I never thought that uh, my what things that I make would be living in the same institutions of these things that my own ancestors' um, objects are located in. Um, you know, a lot of people have different feelings about that, but to me, it's very welcoming. And to me, it's like, uh, it, it's my like direct relationship with those ancestors, even though they're no longer living. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to get into, you know, what we're here to talk about today. Um, I've never used a clicker, so let's see if this, this cooperates with me. Um, so the first word you kind of see up there, underneath the community curator talk. I just kind of put this together like last minute too, so. <laughs> um, but the the word up there, which, let's see. Dakota Hanyushki. Um, Dakota obviously 
you know, refers to us Dakota people. But the word Hanyushki, um, if you're not familiar with the Dakota language, um, and, and for those who are, you know, this this might be a new word for you. Um, you know, and in the older people, they just call it, you know, saying it in Indian, like, oh, like in what does that mean in Indian, or how do you say that in Indian? But when they say that, they mean how do you say that in the Dakota language? Um, so in Daco in the Dakota language, um, a lot of our slang and a lot of our uh, more endearing terms for things like your footwear, like your shoes, we call them hampa. And that's still a legit word that still means, you know, your footwear. But um, you can see that there's a root word there, ha, huh, which um, is part of the word for footwear. So it's talking about a specific type of footwear. And so together with yushki, yushki means to, to pucker or to gather. And I came about this word when I was working um, re with revitalizing traditional Dakota pucker toe moccasins. Um, and I was in the Upper Sioux community, which, you know, traditionally they're called the Pejutazizi um, Otunwe, the Yellow Medicine Village um, over by Granite Falls, Minnesota. Um, an elder, Akushi, Akushi is, for those who don't know, is our word for like a grandmother. But even if they're not related to us, we just say, you know, oh, this Kushi over here, or same like, you know, this auntie, this Tumi, or this uncle, this Dekshi, this grandpa, Ungana. Um, when they carry themselves that way, it's like, you know, that's, that's kind of who they are in the community, even if they don't even know you. Um, they'll call you Tokoja, they'll call you grandchild or grandson, granddaughter, or niece or nephew, you know, right off the bat. So this, this, this grandmother, she showed me this word and she told me that that's what that specific type of moxin, which is the type of moxins you see in the community curator case, you see those up there. And that's what those, um, those type are called, whereas there's other types of footwear, there's other types of moccasins that have specific names. And so I just wanted to point that out before we get started, because you see it a lot um, in the, like I said, you see that word on the community curator case. Um, and I'm very, very thankful that, um, uh, and, and I just, I just want to applaud the Science Museum for really making that step to really include Indigenous languages on the display case, because, um, you know, we unfortunately a lot of us have to think in English, which is not a which is a foreign language to us, and that's still kind of unless you're a first language speaker, that kind of skews the way that you you um, learn the language. But you know, we're learning, we're reclaiming our languages, and I'm just really thankful that my community curator case was able to be translated in Dakota Yapi um, and other ones that are also in like in the Shinabe or other languages or even other foreign languages that are not. English. <laughs> um, I just think that's really commendable. So I just want to say thank you for the Science Museum for really putting that effort forward because it really puts importance on first languages because those languages are the first languages of this literal land that we're on right now. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> so <laughs> this is a really bad picture, but um, this photo um, I remember seeing when I was little, well, not little, like younger. And um, I just thought it was really cool. I just thought these guys um, were dressed, you know, in their Sunday best. They're dressed to the nines. Um, back in the, this was taken in the late 1800s. So back in those days, taking a photo was a really big deal. You know, we're lucky to have photos of our ancestors from that era because taking a photo in itself of itself back then was the process, right? But <clears throat> I knew that these guys, these gentlemen, were from my community. Were from Prairie Island. And I figured I'm related to probably all of them. Um, and from what I understand, this older gentleman right here, and I think this gentleman right here, are the father and I believe the uncle of people of my great, great grandmother um, on my grandfather's maternal side. And so, and it just, I, I just thought it was really cool. And I just thought, oh, like they're dressed really nicely. but. I've always held on to this photograph and it's always been inspiring to me because their clothing was very different from what I thought Dakota people dressed like. Um, what they're wearing is kind of more, might be more visually associated with our Anishinaabe neighbors or our Potawatomi neighbors or Menominee neighbors or Ho-Chunk neighbors, but they're all Dakota. They're all Dakota men. And so I've just always really liked this photo. It, like I said, it's what inspires me. And I think that 
they would these men would be happy to know that i'm doing the work that i'm doing in revitalizing to my best ability to revitalizing traditional material culture um, i also pull up this photo a lot um, this gentleman right here is big eagle and like i said he's one of my ancestors and it's believed that this is also Wabasha, which is another one of my ancestors. Um, again, they, you can see that they're wearing a bit of a mix of, you know, traditional Dakota clothing, um, even more so with like the eagle right here. But you can see that they're, they're kind of adapting Western clothing, you know, European style clothing. But I always like to look at this photo as well, because you can see, um, if, you, if you haven't seen what the pucker tail moccasins look like, you can see them in the community curator case. We'll get into it. You know, here in a minute, but um, I just understood that 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 they were wearing pucker toe moccasins in this in this photo, and this is from a delegation of chiefs that were sent to, and I didn't include that, but they were sent to Washington D.C. in the 1850, late 1850s, before things really kind of hit the fan here in 1862, and that's a whole other history, and I don't think I have time to get into that now, but <laughs> um, but you know, I I just think it's really cool because they're very dignified. You know, they knew that they were going there to make an impression that they had to go there and represent our people and to um, uh, uh, make relations with the U.S. government because they understood as leaders that they have to work with them. But unfortunately, you know, it, nothing really um, happened the way it was supposed to. But I just like that they're all very dressed, very dignified. And um, that, you know, again, I think that it's it's interesting that you know, they're wearing pucker toe moccasins because it just kept on, I just kept on seeing them in these old photos that I was looking at. And I always look at old photos and I have lots for reference um, because they're the very few remnants of our material culture because you can see them dressed that way. And, you know, a lot of, um, you would think when you hear like Dakota or Sioux people as, as um, you know, Anglos call us, you would think they'd be wearing like war bonnets and all this kind of, you know, interesting regalia, but it's, it's, they're really not. I mean, maybe they did have them, but um, I just think that really speaks to how nuanced and how diverse we were as a people. And it really does kind of transcend those uh, stereotypes. But that's not to say that those things like war bonnets are not a real thing that we, that we do use and we do hold in a really high regard. <clears throat> so again, you know, I was looking at all these photos and um, a photo like this as well. Um, it's a really sad photo. You can see the um, the the cost of war on her face. This young woman. Um, this photo, I believe, was is part of a big batch of photos that were taken in the St. Paul area by the. I think you can see the gal the the name of the gallery. Oh, right there. It's Upton. Um, you know, they were going to when Dakota people were imprisoned in Fort Snelling. They were going there and. They were kind of a. Uh, I think they would still bring people into their gallery, but they were able to take pictures of Dakota people, kind of more in our own, I don't know, element. But they were in a. They were imprisoned, so it was still a really sad time for them. But you can see the the kind of disparity on her face. Um, you know, she's sitting outside of a teepee. But when I um, I actually went, and this is from the Minnesota History um, Soci Historical Society. Um, I purchased uh, digital copies, digital scans of these photos, of these um, glass plate photos. And what's really cool about them, even though they're very sad photos, what's really cool about them is that if you zoom in on those um, those photos, they're very, very high contrast. You think that's a really old way of taking photos, but they were really good at getting a lot of the details in those photos. And it's just a matter of looking at them very closely. The original photo is probably only like this big. Um, when I looked at the photo, again, I can see, I could see that she's wearing pucker toe moccasins. And so just, it kept like coming up whenever I was looking at these photos and yet there's still people, there were, you know, I would always come across people that, our own people actually, my own even relatives that would be like, no, we didn't wear those type of moccasins. Those are Ojibwe style. Those are whatever style. And they are, but I'm also like, well, why are they wearing them here? There's literal proof of that. And they'd always kind of be an excuse. Oh, well, they traded for them or, oh, well, they whatever, whatever. And that's, that's plausible. But I like to really try to give our ancestors lots of credit. Um, I think they deserve more credit than just, you know, 
not also coming to the same conclusions as their neighboring tribes. And also, I think it's cool that you can see the beadwork um, details on the vamps. Um, for people who don't make moccasins, um, the piece that's kind of colored right here, these oval-shaped pieces, um, we call those vamps, or a lot of people call those vamps when they're um, putting moccasins together. Um, you would um, bead those or decorate them, or however, you would decorate them first before you put the moccasins together. And the moccasin itself is actually a soft sole moccasin, and we'll get into that. And we'll get into those kind of differences in a minute. But um, it's it's one piece of uh, buckskin that's kind of wrapping wrapping up on top of the foot, and it's kind of stitched together. And the vamp is the is sort of an insert or like a tongue, you know. Um, and so you would you would decorate that before you put it together, and it's just cool that you can see some of the floral shapes that. Um, that are on her moccasins. And Dakota Florals has its own, is its own distinct style. I don't have time to get into that either, but you know, that's another thing that people are like, well, Dakota's never had florals, but you can just see real, very clear examples of that. Um, so yeah, so I, a lot of these photos, regardless of how sad they are, and even, um, I don't know, I can't really read that writing, but there's, oh yeah, see, there's a, a really super archaic term right there on the end of that photo, the, S word, I don't want to say it, but you know, it's hard to see that stuff. But also I look at these photos as teachers because it's it's kind of really all we have left of our ancestors, unless we have physical objects. Um, again, another photo that I've looked at. I, I looked, I've literally looked at so many old photos, like I have a whole album on my phone. <laughs> um, but this is uh Ampetu Tokecha. And um he was known as John Other Day when he was given a uh, English name. Um, and he was a, a pretty uh, prominent leader, I guess, in our, in, for our people, or he was making a lot of, doing a lot of negotiations with non-natives. And I believe he was, um, he was baptized and became like a religious person, I think, or something like that. Um, but I just like this photo of him because he's obviously, he's dressed in his best and he's showing off what he has. And, uh, you know, his clothing is really cool. But again, I can see those pucker toe moccasins. And you can see a bit of a, a thing right here on the bottom of his moccasins. Um, I've really come to see how, I don't know how they would do this or where, where they would go, but a lot of people in those days um, were taking their shoes and getting them cobbled at like a shoe, uh, you know, a shoe, a cobbler. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what, their, what their business is called, but they would, get, they would put hard soles on the bottom of them to kind of preserve them because, um, See, because they're soft sold, it gets worn out really easily, and you do have to replace the hide, which isn't a hard thing to do. But maybe to save time and save materials, they would they would get them cobbled, which is really interesting. Um, so yeah, I'm just I'm always seeing these photos, always using them for reference. And so when I say that, you know, people assume that pucker toe moccasins are just Ojibwe style, and they are. Um, these are a pair of moccasins that I have seen and I looked at up close um, from the, the MHS collection. Um, and they're very beautiful, like prime examples of Ojibwe style and Anishinaabe style um, floral beadwork and moccasin um, construction. And there's a few times when you can really see, because some people are like, well, what are the differences between Dakota ones and Ojibwe ones? And there is some differences and then there isn't sometimes. It's, it's very gray. And um, I kind of spend a lot of my time looking at how they're different and how they're similar and how they borrowed from each other. I mean, you know, it's 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 all very nuanced. It's all very, um, you know, neither here nor there. Um, so my kind of journey even was even more uh, catapulted forward when I seen this pair of moccasins on the MHS's um, website, which they don't have their, their collections on their website right now, but it, they will be soon. <laughs> but at the time you could go on their website and you could look at their collections um, and just look at pictures and see, oh, like this is what they have. And then it would give the provenance and it'd give, you know, where they came from. And I was in college, I was spending my first year at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Um, I didn't graduate from there, but <clears throat> go Bulldogs. Um, but, um, I was sitting there, I was supposed to be studying, but I was just surfing the web and I was looking at, um, you know, 
beadwork. I was looking, you know, like, like that's what I kind of did on the side. I was doing beadwork. I was making stuff. Um, I didn't consider beadwork or anything like that art at the time, but, you know, I've come to understand it as now. But I seen this pair and I was like, those are very interesting. And then again, I was like, wow, like we really did wear, like no one, no one that I knew in my community and in other Dakota communities made these, did not know how to make these um, as far as I understood. And it just kind of further cemented, like, you know, maybe I should learn how to do these. And like, I think I remember right away, right away, like asking some of my Anishinaabe friends how to um, make this style because I, I knew how to make moccasins, but I didn't know how to make this kind. And it's very different than the other kind that I make. Um, and so thankfully I had a friend who's Anishinaabe. She um, showed me how to do them and she gave me her pattern. And then from there, I kind of made my own pattern on how to make them and how to put them together. Um, and these are really cool. They're very, um, these are at the, um, like I said, MHS. They're in very pr pristine condition. They're really amazing examples of Dakota pucker tail moccasins. They came, um, I believe, I, as, I, as I understand, they came to the MHS um, through the Bishop Whipple collection when Bishop Whipple was working with um, Dakota and Ojibwe people. And um, it came from a very specific group of women in um, Lower Sioux, at the Lower Sioux community, and that's where my grandmother's from. Um, so whoever made these, I could very possibly be related to even. And uh, I believe she might have made them, and Bishop Whipple or his wife would have bought them off of them right away because these women, these Dakota women, were also kind of like getting together. They were making lace. They were making embroidery. They were learning these kind of non-native, you know, European woman crafts at the time, you know, stuff like that was considered craft in those days. I believe the dates on them is like 1900s or late 1800s. Um, but they, they were never worn and they're kept in very pristine condition and they're very awesome examples. And the hide, the buckskin that's on them is so soft and supple and it looks like it's like fresh. That's, that's what's really amazing about them. And the, they're decorated using ribbon work, which is something that you see an example of in the community curator case. Um, and I don't have time to get into that right now, but we looked at some examples today when we were in the in the collections. Um, and then my favorite pair that is of all of all moccasins that I've seen so far, this pair um, right here is also at the MHS collection. Um, just for reference, a lot of the Dakota pucker toe moccasins, the he biggest concentration of them is here in you know the Twin Cities at MHS and also here at the Science Museum. Um, that's where I've seen the most of them. Um, I've gone to other museums and seen, you know, a few here and there, but even then they're questioned on if they're even Dakota. Um, and I'll get into that again in a minute. <clears throat> but this pair was um, made by um, a woman that they came to know as Old Betts, and she was a Dakota woman. A very, uh, they, they liked to say in those days in the 18... 60s that she was like the oldest Indian living or something and she was claimed to be like a hundred and something years old and she might have been but she wasn't that old really um but she was famous a lot of people just kind of like in the St. Paul area knew her as like a character and they would go and buy things from her and I think she would as far as I understand in my research she did make moccasins and she would um sell them to you know non-native people and you know make her money that way um I think she lived she lived somewhere near Mendota Heights, and she would, I read that she would take a train and have all these things that she's going to sell in like a sack, and she'd throw the sack over her shoulder and take the train up to St. Paul and, you know, sit in this somewhere here in downtown and sell them. But she made this pair specifically, I believe, for, um, I could be incorrect, but I'm pretty sure she made these for um, Henry Sibley, um, who was a general or, you know, that worked for the, the army. Um, and they're really awesome. And the, the beadwork on them is really amazing. Um, again, these are very actually pretty pristine as well. Um, the little silk ribbon, little wrap, ruffles and all that stuff is very delicate and very sweet looking. Um, but the beadwork is so very much not like what I think of when I think of Dakota florals. And again, you know, I don't have time to get into that, but um, they're just really, really awesome. And they're, they're like my favorite pair. And I like to look at them and be inspired by them. So when I was talking about hard sole moccasins, um, to kind of put it briefly, this is kind of what we what we call a hard sole moccasin, which is a, more of a plain style, which is more out west. Um, 
you know, you see a lot of this more, well, you see it now, thanks to like, you know, power culture, you see them kind of all over, but um, you would see these more in North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, you know, all, that kind of area, the Great Plains area. And I believe that, I was just talking with, with uh, Pajuta about this, but we kind of came to the conclusion that Dakota people in this area probably still did wear these type. And I think it was more so of when they got into more of a rugged area that was, you know, like on the plains, there was the little prickly pear cactus and you might've come across that and those would tear up your soft sole mocks. So you might've switched into these to, you know, to guard your, the bottoms of your feet and, um, you know, for more hardy conditions. And whereas soft sole moccasins would be more for wooded areas and more um, softer bedding. And so they have a, um, this is a pair that I've made um, that someone commissioned off of me. Um, and then another, um, I believe they're, these are either Hiratsa or Rikura. Um, they're from the, the MHS collection. Um, and you can see that their construction is very different. It's, it's um, a type of moccasin where the buckskin just kind of sits on top of your foot and you kind of make it to form around your foot and you, you know, put your foot in. Um, and the the hard, the sole on the bottom is hard. It's a like I said, it's a hard sole, and it's um, a little more sturdier. A lot of people in today's power culture would prefer to use these when they're dancing because it, you know, they're not they wouldn't get worn out so fast. But a lot of people are starting to use pucker toe moccasins in their regalia, which is really cool. So um, to kind of give more context of why I was in these museum spaces so much. Um, well, even actually, I didn't even write it down here, but in 2014, I was in a museum fellowship um, with undergrad students. And I was, a, I then was here in this, the Twin Cities and I was going to art school at MCAD, which is where I graduated um, with my bachelor's degree. Um, and I, I knew of this uh, fellowship that, they were, that MHS was putting on and it was for undergrad, native undergrad students to spend time with um, the museum and other um, locations that belong to the, his, the Minnesota Historical Society, because it's more than just the History Center. It's these, you know, these different um, locations that they have throughout Minnesota. So, you know, I kind of got to know the people there, got to make friendships and build relationships there. And then I, I while I was there, I understood, it's like a two-week program that they did back then. I think it's different now, but um, I, I, under, I knew that they were doing this uh, Native American, Native American Artist in Residency. Um, and they were offering it for Native artists from the Upper Midwest area. And it's it, uh, what you were allowed to do if you got that residency was to spend time with the collections um, and the museum would support you as well, like, um, you know, financially even, which is really awesome for artists. And you got to spend time with these collections. You got to travel to other museums and understand what they have in their collections and tie it to what you were doing. And I applied three times. Um, on the third time, I got it. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was a big process, too. I had to really rethink my portfolio. I had to rethink my application. I had to get different letters of recommendation, you know, all that stuff. And I had to make sure that I was very clear in what I wanted to do and what I wanted to research. And the, one of the things that they really strive for is for, um, oops, is for um, types of artwork or cultural patrimony, matrimony, whatever. Um, that is endangered in communities, not necessarily gone, but endangered, meaning that people don't often do it and it needs to be revitalized, which I'm very thankful for. Um, and so obviously I wanted to talk about and help revitalize and spark a conversation around Dakota pucker toe moccasins, because even though it's something so very simple as just a footwear, it really opens up this conversation about who we are as Dakota people and, you know, really rethinking like, our, our relationship to our surrounding area and our relationship to other tribes and our relationship, you know, just how things have just gone down for us. It, you know, to me, um, when I, and um, part of the uh, residency was you have to go and, um, pub, uh, I forget what it was called, but you have to kind of give back to the community. You have to do something with the community, even if it's just one person who's like your apprentice, you can, do that or you could do like workshops. So I chose to do workshops and I wanted to really get the conversation going. Um, and that's when that's one thing that while we're sitting, we're all sitting there making these moccasins and I'm teaching these people how to make these, um, was really sparking the conversation. Oh, like, you know, like, like does this, does this kind of change your perception of who our people are? 
um, do, does it really make you think about what um, they went through and where they came from? And obviously, even something as simple as like material culture, it really can it can really start to um, spark that in them. Um, and my goal was to go to all four of our Dakota communities in Minnesota, which I did, um, and teach how to make these moccasins. Um, and again, that's where I was when I was in um, Upper Sioux, was when you know that grandma was you know telling me about it. And um, it was really cool too um, in that instance because I knew that I would face a little bit of um, pushback from the communities. But what I really got was like older people were like, I haven't seen this type of moccasin since I was a little girl. Or, oh, this, that's cool. That's the old style, how they used to wear, um, you know, make them. And it just really like warmed my heart to like make them feel like, like something was being brought back and to like let them be seen and let them be, um, just give them, give our elders hope because, you know, it's a struggle for younger people to want to be involved in our culture. And so, and then I also went to, um, of course, Dakota people are a larger diaspora outside of Minnesota. I went to other tribes in South Dakota um, and North Dakota, no, South Dakota um, to teach this as well. And I was, and they, they were like, right, they were like, like clawing at the bit to get me to come to the community. And I was really thankful for that too, that there was an interest there. Um, another part of the residency, which is what kind of, sorry, which is what kind of tied me into coming to the Science Museum was, um, you know, like I said, you get to visit these different museums and see the collections that they have there and travel, but I didn't really have to do a lot of traveling. A lot of what I had to look at was already here. So obviously I spent time at the History Center in their collections. Um, I also came here to the Science Museum and this was in 2018, so this was a while ago. Um, and I understood that they, you know, I didn't even know that they had a lot of collections as far as native indigenous, you know, material culture, but they did, they do. Thankfully, though, and um, I also went to the National Museum of American Indian in Washington, D.C., and I also went to the Milwaukee Public Museum. And then in the end, the MHS acquired four pairs of moccasins off of me for their permanent collection, and that's where they remain now. And I think there's one pair that's on display at the Fort Snelling uh, historical site, which is really cool, and I have, I have yet to see them in person yet. And that was also um, right before the pandemic happened, so I haven't really seen my moccasins since then. <laughs> I literally dropped them off and like a week later we were in quarantine, which is crazy to think about now. So this is me quickly. This is me at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC. Actually their collections database is not on the National Mall where the museum is. That This was actually at, um, I believe in Maryland, um, where they have to, they have an offsite collections place and then whenever they put something on display, they have to like haul it over. Um, but it was just cool to like they have a huge collection of course and it was just cool to to see it all and i couldn't i couldn't see it all in one day i had to be really specific about what i wanted to see <clears throat> and this is just um me uh, uh teaching how to make moccasins in these workshops in different um, communities uh this was over in flandreau which is just outside of the minnesota south dakota border where i also have relatives from uh, my great-grandfather was from there and uh this is in my community, my home community. Um, and it just really warmed my heart to have a lot of, um, for non-Native people, what a lot of Native people do, how our community is really based around is um, a, a concept that I recently learned about, they call it the kitchen table. And it's just where a lot of Native people come together and they form community and they maintain community that way. And they sit around and these aunties and grandmas or these uncles, they all sit around and they talk and they're working on things. You know, maybe the aunties and grandmas are beading or they're making quilts and the grandpas and the uncles are, you know, smoking and then carving something or whatever, singing. You know, that's how Native community is. That's how I kind of knew it growing up. Um, and it was just really good to see the communities come together to learn how to do this stuff. It was just really heartwarming. <clears throat> so these are some of the moccasins that the MHS acquired for me. Um, I gave them all names. The, this red pair I called Primrose and the blue ish pair I called infinity um, and uh, it was a little hard to depart with them because they would never be worn I would never get to wear them but also I knew that they'll they'll live they'll live forever in the museum as hopefully <laughs> like as long as the museum doesn't get burned down or something um, but you know these will these, these this is my legacy this is what I leave behind and I'm really thankful that it's there 
you know? Cause, and I'm all, but I'm also thankful when people ask me to make moccasins for them because they'll be loved, they'll be worn and that's fine if they get worn out or even if they lose one of them, like that sucks. But, um, you know, that's, that's, they still cherish it enough to use it. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of both. Um, and these are just quickly pairs of moccasins that people have asked me to make. Um, I got better over time for sure. <laughs> um, the, you know, I think I was still coming into how I wanted to do these moccasins when I was doing these pairs. Um, but then, you know, afterwards and in the process, I was learning to kind of get better at how I wanted to make them look and how I wanted the, um, the beadwork to be and my colors that I put together and whatnot. Um, I don't even really like being paid for doing this. I like to trade with people. So these people traded, traded me for these moccasins. And um, this blue pair right here, these got worn out. The guy who got these like wore them out. Like they look like they got ran over when, when he was done, when he gave them back to me to see if I could fix them. And I was like, I can't fix these. <laughs> um, again, you know, more pairs that I've made. This was made for our former um, president. She recently resigned from our, our, uh, her position um, in, uh, uh, in our, on our tribal council. And I just, uh, I was asked to make these by her daughter my cousin. Um, and just, just to know that, you know, she was appreciated in her job. Um, this pair right here, um, kind of a sad story behind it, an elder, our oldest living elder in our community, he also recognized the style of moccasin. We call, we call him Uncle Howie. Um, and he wanted me to make him moccasins, and I believe that he wanted them for when he goes, for when he's buried, because we, in our culture, we, we you know, there's things that we send with our relatives and, um, excuse me. And so he wanted me to, make these for him and I didn't get to finish them before he passed away so um but I think of him so um the Shakopee the uh, Shakopee Cultural Museum they uh actually purchased these for their collection I finished them and I was able to um you know send them over there and I just I say that they're for Uncle Howie and I know that they'll be even though they're living over there in Shakopee like they're for him you know <clears throat> so, um, so again, it all like really uh, starts up this conversation of like beyond just like the footwear, like literally like clothing even, you know, like really talking about what their clothing was like and why they chose the things that they wanted to wear and, you know, what those pictures of them, you know, in the, in that I showed before, like that was like their Sunday best too, you know, like they wouldn't just pose for a picture and, you know, look shabby, they would really dress up because they knew that even if, even though it was a hard um, environment that they were in, they probably still wanted to look good, you know? And I like to, a lot of our um, people like to really, really um, make our ancestors up to be very humble. And they were very humble people, but they were also slaves of fashion. Like, that's what I was talking about. It was like, they, they knew, like, for what was fashionable for them, there was trends, which I think is really cool. And even though it might seem a little mundane or whatever, it's still very sophisticated for a people that aren't, um, uh, you know, in Europe somewhere, they're over here, but they had trends amongst themselves, which is really cool. And so just other things that, you know, men were wearing was, um, uh, you know, buckskin leggings that have a certain way that they're constructed because um, they didn't really wear pants. Um, an otter, the photo from, of John the other day, he has a otter, a turban on and that's a whole otter hide um or they would often take a finger woven belt which is a trade item and they would wrap it around their head um and just other things um the guard the the things that were on his uh underneath his kneecaps they were uh, garters um and, and so they're just all these different things and a lot of them did have meaning there's very specific meaning behind some of them but again they maybe they wanted them because they thought it looked nice you know you never know um women's clothing as well i i've I can only know so much about this because I'm not a woman, so I can't really get into s some of the really specific things behind them. So all I, all I know is just more visual. Um, you know, they were wearing skirts and blouses from wool and nice cotton material that they were getting through trade um, and uh, leggings that covered up their legs. And then they were obviously wearing moccasins, um, a shawl or a wearing blanket. There's a picture I have where a, a woman is wearing a blanket that's adorned with silk ribbon work and the ribbon work like i said um it's a whole history behind it but you know they were really 
um, keen at using silk ribbons through trade, but making like a whole art form out of them and um, by hand in those days with like one needle that they might have traded like a bunch of beaver pelts for and really trying to like savor that needle. <laughs> Whereas like now we can get a needle in like a pack and if you lose one or break one, it's like just get a new one. But you know, if you were, if you broke that needle or lost it, you're SOL. Um, and you know, other things that uh, jewelry wise, they were wearing necklaces. They're uh, one thing that I kind of heard, which I think is um, comes from also from like our Ho Chunk neighbors was that the more necklaces you had on, it really showed off how rich you were and how, uh, you know, how much maybe your family thought of you to give you that much or how much you might've paid, like traded or paid for those beads and those things that they're wearing around their neck. Um, ball and cone earrings, which is a trade item that they're made out of silver and brooches and whatnot. And of course they were masters of ribbon work, bead work and quill work, which was all done by women in those days. And I don't think women get enough, native women, Dakota women don't get enough credit for being the masters of those art forms. They're never, it's never, when you see beadwork or quill work or whatever in a museum, it's never said made by a so-and-so woman or made by a woman of this tribe. It's just the tribe. And uh, I think that's something that museums need to go about changing. Because men didn't really do that kind of work until a certain time. And that's okay, because it helps preserve those art forms. Um, so just some really cool photos that I love to look at. Again, I, I got both of them here because I think that they're very prime examples of what Dakota people were wearing in those, you know, mid 1800s, you know, before we were forced into this diaspora. Um, I think it's funny that they call him a Sioux dandy here because dandy is like a, like an 1800s type of word for like a, a young man or, you know, whatever. Um, but he would have went there and he has a war club in his hand too. And that, even though that looks intimidating, it's used for times of war. It's a status symbol for him, you know, and it's, it's, it's to show off that he's serious, even though he's holding it in a manner of peace by holding it, you know, across his arm. But, you know, it's what it was used for is, is, is for times of war. But <clears throat> he might have shown up to that, that this is in a, um, I think this is Upton as well in St. Paul. Uh, this was in a gallery, I think, I believe. And uh, he might have showed up there in his best, his Sunday best, you know, because he knew that he was being photographed and he wanted to look good. And same for her. I don't know. His name is here. I don't know if that's really his name, though, but um, I don't know her name. But, you know, again, a Dakota woman. And again, you can see their, their pucker toe moccasins. Um, and she's maybe covering up a little bit. As a, a Dakota woman in those days, they're very, they're very modest, and a lot of traditional teachings, you know, women are still very modest, and that's that's where they draw their their um, power from, I believe, as women that they hold themselves very sacredly, and that's something that you know a lot of teachings uh, tell us too. Um, and I think that's what you know sets Native women apart sometimes is that they really do think of themselves, especially in these days, they knew that they were very sacred beings, and so. It's not out of an act of oppression that she's holding a blanket around herself. It's a, an act of protection, I believe. Um, <clears throat> so you can see her skirt, uh, you know, is made of wool, her leggings, her pucker toe moccasins, and she has necklaces around her neck, but and she's wearing these um, different version of uh, a ball and cone earring. And so again, she came there because she wanted to look good while she got her photo taken. And what's really cool, um, and fun fact, this, uh, thing that's behind her and you can kind of see it behind him it's a uh, and I know somebody who does glass plate photography he like it's like a vintage way of doing it now but even today in today's time if you want to get a glass plate photo done of you you have to stand really still for like five minutes because they have to make sure the the focus is correct on you and um this thing that's behind them which uh this guy that I know uses the same thing it looks like a big microphone stand and it has a prong on the back and that prong would be holding, oh, that prong would be um, um, holding their head in place because Sorry, the microphone died. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, so the, the that thing would be holding their head in place because if they move their head, the, the photo would turn out shaky. So it's 
fun fact, you know, I thought it's really cool. And you see them in a lot of these photos where they're standing, you can actually see that thing behind them, which is really interesting. Um, so again, um, you know, we were looking at these items earlier, but the Science Museum has some really interesting items in there. And uh, another example, which I love to look at, and I think I might've been more excited than everyone else who was looking at them today, but these dolls here, oops, sorry. These dolls here um, are Dakota dolls that were made, um, handmade. Um, they have little tiny ribbon work details all over them, but you can see their clothing is very much like these people here. And so to have these, this very small example of Dakota material culture and clothing is really, really awesome and really important, I think. And it's really awesome that it's preserved here. Um, it's a little faded, the ribbons are a little faded um, here and there, but it's, it's you know, that's okay. Um, you know, he's wearing little leggings and she's wearing little leggings and her skirt has ribbon work on them. And then they have a little baby who's in a cradle board, which is really cool and very tiny. It's only like this big. Um, and this was all done by hand. And so I think um, one of the, um, one of my, my auntie who was here earlier, she said, you know, someone who made these had to have loved their, loved their child so much to make these things by hand and to hand sew all these little ribbons into these little shapes, really, really tiny stitches. You know, that's how much they loved their children. And that's very much how, um, you know, in, I guess in a Western con concept, they say like you're spoiling that child, but no, it's like they really do love their children so much that they would make these things for them. Um, and what's really cool about them is that they have little tiny pucker tail moccasins, which is really, really cool. And when I seen them, um, when I was first doing research, um, I just thought that was so cool. <laughs> and that's why I like looking at them. I like showing them off because again, this is more and more proof of people like, well, they, we didn't wear that style, but well, you know, you see it in photos and you see it in dolls even. I mean, you know, how much more proof do you need? Um, so yeah, they're my favorite thing here to, to look at. Um, yeah, so again, you know, I, I, I just really have to commend the Science Museum for really stepping up and really trying to, and other museums have done this. Not every museum has, that has an indigenous collection. They're really stepping up to make sure that, that, gap in between museums and the way that they unfortunately collected a lot of items um, is being sort of, uh, you know, mended. Um, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect relationship, but they're being mended and they're, they're really trying really, really hard. Um, and, you know, I just, I, I can't really commend the Science Museum because I don't, in other museums I've gone, no museum has utilized indigenous languages the way the Science Museum has. <laughs> and again, I really hope that's a standard that a lot of museums will follow in. Um, and, you know, uh, when this conversation came about and, you know, Pajuta was like, well, what if we, maybe we can get you to make some moccasins for the collection. She's like, let me see, I'm gonna see if I can do that. I was, let me see if we have funds for that. You know, so I was like, okay. And, you know, it came about and I, and I was going through some stuff this past summer. So I was supposed to actually do them a while ago, but thankfully she was able to work with, the museum was able to work work with me through her um, to, you know, let me, allow me to finish them in time. And they're the, you know, the, the two moccasins that are on display upstairs. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just really honored. And, and I know that the museum has newer items on, in their collection. It's not super common for them to acquire things, but when they do, you know, I know that they, that they want it for a reason, um, that they see the, the need for it. And I think that's just, it, it just really, Help makes you feel um, uh, welcome as a native, as an artist, especially as a native artist. Um, and the museum, uh, the the curator case upstairs is uh, uh, what I curated, but it's also the fact that I also picked specific items from the collection to be displayed. Um, and I don't have good pictures of the ones that I chose or. I don't even have good pictures of my moccasins because I finished them and just brought them right here. <laughs> um, but the specific things I wanted to have in that case, there is one pair that are from my community on Prairie Island. Um, I don't believe I'm related to the person who made them, but the fact that there is even a name is really, really significant. Um, and then there's another pair, which is a beautiful pair of moccasins. Um, I just, and the fact that they are Dakota is, to me, is enough proof to know that they are Dakota made. Um, and they're they're just super awesome. Um, so I just I can't thank you know the Science Museum and Pajuta enough to 
to have given me this opportunity. And this was the this was their end of the deal. So, hey, we do this, you got to do this part. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. <laughs> I can talk forever about this stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and just the fact that my stuff is there is very much like with with this these older um, moxins from hundreds of years ago is just the it, proof that what happened to our ancestors did not pr did not uh, succeed. You know that like we're still here because of our ancestors, and like they could have only hoped for stuff like this to be maintained in their lifetime. You know, they they probably didn't know what the future holds for us, um, future generations. Because we always we kind of say, in a lot of native um, uh, conversation, we say seven generations forward. You know, that's what they were thinking of. But you know, they still had hope in those days. Oh, yeah. So these are some of the 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 more uh, fully adorned uh, pair of moccasins that are up there. Um, they're Dakota made. We don't really know much about else about them, where they came from specifically, but they're super awesome and super rare because the vamp right here is fully beaded. And that's um, not a super common thing for Dakota moccasins. Um, and the cuff themselves, this cuff, the cuffs on moccasins kind of served a tactical purpose, but then they became decorative. And so it's kind of very common, especially for Ojibwe moccasins that the, the cuff is decorated as well. Um, and then the, the ties would go on the, um, the ends of the cuff right here and, you know, tie over your foot. <clears throat> but that, that cuff is uh, very fully adorned in, in, in floral shapes and really abstract floral shapes, and it's really awesome. Um, and then this is the pair of moccasins that was made by Emma other day from Prairie Island. Um, uh, they're very little simpler little worn but what's really cool about them like i said people were putting bringing their moccasins to cobblers to get their shoes cobbled um you know you can there's remnants of that on these moccasins where you can see a heel the stitching where it was there and then they ripped it off but the, the heel and the sort of the on the ball of the foot where like the old school kind of shoes were you know where it was like a heel and like a thing um you can see remnants of that. And I just thought that was really cool when I first seen these moccasins. And I didn't know at the time, actually, when I took this picture, um, that they came from Prairie Island. I had no idea. Um, when I was looking at them again, we couldn't find them, actually, which is really funny. They were they were on this table for like five years almost. <laughs> and then we couldn't, I was like, I know they're here. I just can't, they're not in the collections, in the cases. Where are they? And we were like looking around for them. And uh, I forget who, but they were like, oh, wait. And they lifted up this piece of tissue paper and like oh they're right there <laughs> i was like they've been in there since i was in there like in 2018. um but yeah I, you know i lift i didn't know that at the time and then we looked into them and they came from prairie island which is really interesting um so this is my very very impromptu photo of my moccasins as we finished them as i finished them and delivered them right away um you know, again, I can't thank the museum and Pajuta for their patience. <laughs> um, I'm also getting my master's degree right now. So I was juggling my end of my semester and trying to finish these moccasins before the holiday. <laughs> um, I, finished my, I finished my semester and then I finished these moccasins like last minute. Um, so you can see them a little up close, more up close upstairs. Um, but uh, I, I got a little creative and uh, this pair right here is beaded, but I also put, I also, I do quill work as well, and so they're also quilled, which is really cool to combine them. It's not super common that you see, but you know we're contemporary now, and you know a lot of people are doing really cool things with our artwork. And then the other pair is uh, more just fully beaded and has um, really daintily uh, decorated cuffs. And then the the quilled moccasins they also have ribbon work um, around the the decorative cuff. And then that's me when it was installed. Um, I uh, this was about a couple months ago, and um, I got to see the the moccasins and everything put together. And there's a piece of uh, ribbon work that is Dakota. Um, again, you can see it upstairs, and I just wanted to put it up there and really show like how broad our artwork is as Dakota people, and just how super awesome and delicate they are. And again, it's just it's just such an honor for me to have my moccasins next to these really old moccasins. Um, again, it's a, it's a direct line, you know, that was never broken. Um, and I just want to end by saying that <clears throat> these moments are our ancestors' wildest dreams. And we ate earlier today um, with a lunch provided. It was really good. And it was suggested that we make a spirit plate because we spent, and I, and I, I made the spirit plate and I made the prayer. Um, we do that a lot in Native 
uh, communities before we eat, we make a spirit, a spirit dish where we feed the spirits first. And we only put a little bit on there, but it's our way of acknowledging our ancestors before us. And I said, you know, it's good that we're doing that because, you know, we spent time today. P people from my community, my relatives came, uh, my sister's here, <laughs> and, you know, my, my older brother's here, and, you know, his wife and my nephews, and they're all, and my brother in law, they're all here. And I had other members of my family here too. My godson too, he's over there. <laughs> um, and you know, so we're like a family though, you know, our whole, our whole community really is like a family. And, you know, I, I said, I'm gonna make a spirit plate, you know, I'm gonna make a prayer. And, you know, we got to spend time with our relatives today. They allowed us to come into the space and to, to spend time with their things that were left behind that, that survived. And, you know, now we should feed them and give them something for letting us do that. And, you know, again, it, that's, that, it, th that moment is all they could ask for, I think. And, and this is a picture of my great grandmother, um, Mikushi Ellen uh, Wells Max. Um, I believe that my beadwork skills came from her because she was a pretty well-known beater where she came from. And I have this photo um, printed on my wall in my, um, my beading room. And I always kind of look at it and, you know, kind of give thanks to her for giving me this skill because no one in my, my mom and my, my grandmother, they, they didn't really have time to bead. Um, they were both women who worked and did, you know, their things and it just never really came to them. Um, but I believe that it was her that gave me this ability because that's how we believe too, that our skills and our abilities are gifts. And so I thank her all the time for giving me that skill and that gift. Um, so, yeah. So thank you guys so much. I, I think we have question. We have time for some questions, yeah. But thank you guys, Padama. Yeah, we have time for a question or two. If folks want to raise their hand, and I'll pass you the mic. Don't everybody ask at once? I believe that there are some people, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call some people out. <laughs> I believe that there's some people here representing the uh, History Center, the Minnesota History Center. Um, if someone could explain what the, the current sort of um, phase of the Native American Artists in Residency program is, I'm gonna shamelessly like plug their, that, that residency in here so people can get more interested in it and apply for it maybe for next year. Um, so someone can talk about that, that'd be awesome. Anybody? <laughs> so like they just got uh, the new artists. Hi everyone. So we just got uh, picked our new two artists for this uh, year, and now uh, we're working on our current residencies, and um, they're going to do some uh, community events and classes. So stay tuned for more. But we just started our new wave. <laughs> yeah, and it's open for tribes and enrolled members, but also descendants of tribes in the Minnesota. North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin area, still, right? Okay. And, oh, okay. So yeah, so anyway, so if, if you're an artist and you're watching, or if you know someone who's a native artist from that, those areas, please let them know about this residency. It was really amazing. Obviously I learned a lot from it. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. My name is Fern Naomi Renville, oh, and hi. I am <laughs> just finishing my residency yep. at the History Center. So in April, you can come and help me weave a net out of nettle. Yes. On Saturdays at, um, yeah, at the History Center. Yeah. Um, and where are you from, Fern? I am from Sisseton. I am an enrolled citizen of the Sisseton Wapton. Oh, yeah. Oh, hello. I'm very nearsighted, too. So I'm like, oh, like, I know these people. <laughs> um, I also want to say, um, before I move on, Cole, is that it's such a delight. This is why I came here. This is why I came oh. home is so that I could learn about Dakota material culture. And I've lived, I've, I've learned more about Dakota material culture, uh, more about it in the past three years here and, and working with the History Center than I have in my whole life. And that says nothing about how disconnected or ignorant mm -hmm. Dakota people are. It's about our own um, erasure and the, yeah the severing of the deliberate severing of ourselves yeah. from our land yeah. and the material culture that yeah. um, 
that connected us to that land. So Absolutely. I really appreciate getting to learn all the stuff I didn't know. Now I'm going to have to have you make me a pair of moccasins. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can leave a mat for me and we'll trade. <laughs> um, so, and I just want to say that the, his, the uh, History Center residency has been life-changing in mm -hmm. that way. It has allowed me to um, see myself as a weaver, to imagine that I could have been a potter, that um, these art forms that I didn't grow up knowing were Dakota are, mm -hmm. in fact, completely Dakota. Mm -hmm. So once again, Wopida for sharing yeah, with us. Pirama, thank you. And, 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 you know, I should say, too, like not every museum has this opportunity. Um, I had a really quickly, I had a really crazy experience when I, I went to New York a couple years ago for the first time. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go to the Met and I'm going to go to this museum and that museum. And they're awesome museums and they do, they also do have their own ways of, you know, including Native Indigenous uh, voices and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, it was awesome. Like th their displays are really cool. Nothing was, you know, insensitive. And then I go to the mu National or the Museum of Natural History, like from the movies Night at the Museum. And that was a complete 180. And I was so uncomfortable. But it, recently they were asked, I don't know, I want to say forced, but they were asked to take down all of the Native cultural patrimony that's in that museum. And I'm so happy that they did that because it was, the way they treated the items was just not respectful at all. So not every museum is perfect, of course, but the ones that are, they should be championed a little more. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. They still got people they got to answer to up, 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 you know. <laughs> um, is there any more questions? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> really run for it. Yeah. Um, you were talking about having uh, made a pair for someone and they're getting real beat up. I was curious, can you resole them? Mm -hmm. with, like, the, Can the vamps come out and go into a new, like is that the traditional practice mm -hmm. of just resoling over and over? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I suppose I'll just, um, like exactly what you just said, like the, the person who wore them, because it's all just one, it's basically one piece of, Buckskin, you can see the pattern. Um, if I go back a little further, uh, when I was teaching, yeah, you can see the pattern right here, which is part of the pattern making is 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 like the first part of the workshop, right? <clears throat> and you can see that it is just one piece, and it kind of comes on, on top of your foot. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that will get worn, and that's you know fine. They're very comfortable, but um, it will get worn. And what you can do is exactly what you said: is you can take the um, there's a cutout. She has a cutout. This is my auntie right here, Auntie Levita. Um, she has her cutout for her vamp piece right there. Um, that, and if you're beating it, or even if you just leave it plain, you can still save that if it's not too beat up too. Um, and you can just save that, and then you get a new hide for this part right here. And you just have to take it apart and then just put it back together. So it's, and it's not hard. It's, they're not hard to put, to do that. Um, you know, you just have to do it once in a while. I have a pair, my very first pair I ever made, which I didn't take a, I didn't include a picture of. Um, I, re, I redid them, resold them, redid the hide like three times now, but I retired them because <laughs> they were pretty worn. Um, yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah. And uh, kind of on that note too, one thing I, I had a hard time, a lot of people have a hard time with seeing collections because it is our ancestors' things. I was okay with that, but one thing um, that kind of, it made me feel uneasy, even though they weren't, you know, I, for all I know, they weren't even like burial moccasins. They were just moccasins that someone wore. Um, when I was in the museum at MHS, I remember like, um, it wasn't, wasn't this pair, but it was a pair like this. Um, what happens a lot with those, these soft sole moccasins, they do get worn. And after you wear them for so long, you can actually see someone's footprint underneath on, on the bottom of them and you know like I said that this pair is like fresh and never worn so it was really cool to look at but stuff like those they were very worn and when I lifted this one moccasin up I could see a really perfect indentation of someone's foot and that just made me feel uneasy because that's like their essence that's probably you know I don't know how they got there but that's like their spirit to me in a way too. And I just didn't, I just kind of didn't like that. And I had to kind of, kind of de-assess that in a way. Um, yeah, but it, uh, that was kind of the only time I kind of felt uneasy. But yeah, you, you'll see the wear and tear of them on the bottom of them after a while. Yeah. Are there any other questions?
Well, uh, let's one more hand round of applause for Carol. Yeah. Thank you, guys.